All right, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, so many people here uh, interested in perhaps adopting a non-standard uh, approach, or at least being willing to listen to uh, my ravings, so very heretical though they may be. And I'd like to thank Jim for the idea of uh, getting this together, and I actually look forward to uh, listening to uh, him say a little bit about his exciting new book about an Aristotelian uh, point of view to the philosophy of mathematics. Okay, so I'm uh, rather an anomaly in, in pure mathematics. I don't believe in infinite sets. I don't believe in real numbers. I believe that a lot of mathematics currently, pure mathematics, is logically very weak. Okay, so um, it's an uphill battle to convince people to even consider these horrid possibilities. But I think with the, uh, the increasing advent uh, and influence of computers in our world, the dichotomy between what the computers can do and what the pure mathematicians claim will become increasingly more obvious and uncomfortable. Okay? So I think we're ready to, to adopt some uh, new ways of thinking. And the physicists are not uh, unconvinced of that. Uh, this is a recent last year's article, New Scientists, where they're talking about physicists' approach to thinking about ways of thinking about physics without infinity. So I'd like to uh, pose the against uh, side by framing it in terms of three questions, sort of in, in hierarchical order. I'm going to talk about the three, these three questions. What is a set? Is there a set of all natural numbers? And what's the theory of subsets of n? Okay, and that'll give me a chance to say a few things uh, about the, the problems. Okay, there are, in fact, uh, serious problems. And they start with uh, Cantor's 19, or 1874 definition of what a set is in his sort of outline of this new idea. So his definition was that a set is a gathering together into a whole of definite, distinct objects of our perception or of our thought, which are called elements of the set. That definition has not changed too much over the years. This is a book that I hope many of you will recognize. It's our first year calculus text. And if we look on page three, where we sort of start uh, calculus, the first section is on sets, and the first line reads, a set is a well-defined collection of distinct objects. And then it goes on to say, well, in fact, there are some possible ambiguities about this definition. Okay? And that's really the starting point, is that this definition is not clear enough to distinguish between those things which we want to call sets and those with things which we don't want to call sets. For example, the set of all fish. Is that a set? The set of all mathematical theorems. Is that a set? The set of all sets. Is that a set? Or as Russell uh, discovered, the set of all sets that don't contain themselves. Is that a set? Well, Russell realized that that last set could not possibly be a set for reasons that most of you will, will know. And so that Cantor's original definition was too all-embracing and too ambiguous and does not provide clear boundaries for us to be able to tell when a given set really is a set and when it's not. Okay? So in my view, definitions are, are crucial. We have to have very clear understanding of what the words mean so that everybody can agree that yes, this is a set and yes, this is not a set. In modern mathematics, we play all kinds of grammatical games to avoid the issues. When things become problematic, for example, if we're talking about the fundamental group of a topological space, we do not say, let pi be a function from the set of topological spaces to the set of groups. Because most pure mathematicians know that the set of topological spaces or the set of groups is too big to probably be a, a good set. So we invoke other terms like class. Oh, it's the class of all topological groups. Or perhaps the category of all topological groups or spaces. So we play these games and nobody actually uh, really fronts up and, and tells us what we're actually talking about. So 
these objections are not just mine. These objections were immediately laid onto Cantor when he first started the theory. Many, in fact, most prominent mathematicians at that time vigorously opposed Cantor. Okay. And, for example, we read Gauss, before Cantor's time, said, I protest against the use of infinite magnitude as something completed, which is never permissible in mathematics. Infinity is merely a way of speaking, the true meaning being a limit which certain ratios approach indefinitely close, while others are permitted to increase without restriction. The great French mathematician Henri Poincaré stated, there is no actual infinity. That the Cantorians have forgotten and have been trapped by contradictions. Hermann Weyl, one of the 20th century's most influential mathematicians, stated, classical logic was abstracted from the mathematics of finite sets and their subsets. Forgetful of this limited origin, one afterwards mistook that logic for something above and prior to all mathematics, and finally applied it without justification to the mathematics of infinite sets. This is the fall and original sin of Cantor's set theory. Many other prominent mathematicians uh, had similar views. And in fact, at the early part of the 20th century, the whole theory collapsed in a heap with the discovery of Russell's paradoxes and Bur the For the Burali Forte paradoxes, and even paradoxes that Cantor himself realized. And <clears throat> Subsequently, people struggled mightily to try to resurrect the theory, but they were not able to. And so basically, the 20th century retreated into a, into a, a cocoon of axiomatics. People said, OK, we cannot define exactly what a set is. Let's just pretend that it works. Let's just assume an axiomatic framework in which the notion of a set is undefined, and we just postulate various things that we want to have true about those sets. This is the real reason why axiomatics have played such an important role in 20th century, is to buttress the theory of sets. <clears throat> okay, um, Cantor would have been very surprised to come back now and to discover that all of modern pure mathematics is framed in terms of infinite sets. A circle is an infinite set of points. A line is an infinite set of points. Everything is an infinite set of this or an infinite set of that. How can this possibly be? Right. Well, one of the reasons is that there were champions. Okay? Dedekind and Hilbert were champions of, of set theory because they realized the potential for pinning the foundations of analysis to set theory. Okay? In particular, Hilbert famously stated, no one shall expel us from the paradise that Cantor has created for us. To which Wittgenstein, okay, very important philosopher of the 20th century, retorted famously, if one person can see it as a paradise of mathematicians, why should not another see it as a joke? Okay. In fact, it is a paradise of mathematicians. It's a, it's a happy fairy tale land where many of our wishful dreamings come true. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go carry on. All right, so that's the serious questions about what the definition of a set or a particular an infinite set is. What about just the natural numbers, which are everybody's favorite example of something that which probably should be an infinite set? Well, again, this is like swimming against the historical tide. For most of history, the natural numbers were considered as a sequence that goes beyond us, goes outwards, beyond us, ultimately beyond our view. The idea that you could reach to the very end and grab them all and say, here is a set of, nat of all natural numbers is historically only very recent. In fact, if we go back to Aristotle, he said, as an example of a potentially infinite series in respect to increase, one number can always be added after another in the series that starts one, two, three. But the process of adding more and more numbers cannot be exhausted or completed. This is something that all computer scientists know. You have data structures, you can have big data structures. You cannot have a data structure that contains all the natural numbers. Now, 
early practitioners will say, well, it's so sort of easy, it's all uniform, you just keep adding one, you just can keep doing it. That might be, but the, the seeming uniformity of the natural numbers is a bit of an illusion. Okay? It's an illusion that results from only looking at sort of the small numbers, less than a few trillion trillion. Once we start looking at a number like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, okay, there's a number. That is a reasonably big number, although I could easily write down much bigger numbers. Okay. Um, this is a very special number. It's a very special number because its complexity or information content is so small, evidenced by the fact that I've been able to write it down so quickly. Most numbers between one and this number are not that way at all. Most numbers in this range have huge complexity. Right? In fact, the complexity is such that most numbers between 1 and this z are so big that they cannot be expressed in any fashion whatsoever in the known universe. Even if you constructed a massive hard drive that spanned the galaxies, where you're writing at the level of quarks, and you have trillions of digits you can choose from, and you've got this huge possible array of, of places to put numbers, most numbers in this range cannot be expressed in the known universe with such a mega computer. So the idea of their existence is in fact problematic. It's not at all obvious that they even exist. And this is what happens if we actually start going further and further in the sequence. It appears more like some kind of fractal. Okay? The complexity goes up and down in some very wildly unpredictable way, and it becomes far from uniform. So the best antidote to thinking that you understand the set of all natural numbers is to play around with arithmetic of some big numbers. Ask yourself, for example, does this thing have a prime factorization? It doesn't have a prime factorization. I know you've learned this theorem that all natural numbers have prime factorization. It's not true. It's only true up to a certain point. That depends on our computational machines. Okay? This number is not factorizable into primes, never, never will be. Our universe is just too small to contain the things that ought to be prime factors for it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes, we would like to have sta say sta statements like all of this is all of that, but it's just not computationally true in the world in which we actually live. Okay, now let me come to the final uh, point very quickly. What is the theory of subsets of n? And here we unfortunately um, meet some serious problems in analysis. Okay. Let's suppose that we have, for the sake of argument, agreed that there is such a thing as the set of natural numbers, n, and we're thinking about subsets of n. Okay, a subset is determined by a, a choice. Right, we're going to choose whether we're going to include that one, or not include that one, or include that one. So subsets really can be described in two ways. One is by a sort of a choice point of view, where we're making choices for each natural number whether to include or not. Another way of thinking about a subset is via an algorithm or procedure or law that, dis that generates elements. Okay. As opposed to finite sets, this is a huge difference. When we go to infinite sets, the difference between these two ways of thinking about subsets is enormous. Okay. For this one here, we implicitly need the axiom of choice. In order to be able to say that you, we are capable of making a choice for each one of these natural numbers independently of all the others, that's the axiom of choice. A computer scientist will say, that's nonsense. Everything is, a, is a, an algorithm, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. It's got to be finitely specifiable. But if you, if you think about these two choices, they lead to dramatically different views of not just subsets of natural numbers, but basically so-called real numbers. Because when we're talking about decimals or digits, zeros and ones, we're basically talking about real numbers. So this problem here is really directly related to the very serious problems with the nature of the continuum and the, the structure and the arithmetic of real numbers. You've all been taught that there is such a theory. You have been misled, I'm afraid. Okay. For example, here on the next page, on page four, we find 
page four of our calculus text, introduction of real numbers. I'm going to read this to you. Our study of calculus is based on the real number system. Yes, that's true. The real number system consists of the set of real numbers together with the familiar arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and certain other properties which are reviewed briefly here. And then there's a discussion of order properties and boundedness and so on. As for an actual definition of what a real number is, as for an actual definition of how you actually add them, multiply them, etc., as for an actual proof that the laws of arithmetic are valid, forget it. And it's not just this calculus book, they're all the same. They all try to squirm out of this very serious obligation to say exactly what the real numbers are, to have an, a proper theory of subsets. Wittgenstein, let me finish with a quote of his. He understood this, this distinction, this very important uh, problem very well. And he stated, The mistake in the set theoretical approach consists time and again in treating laws and enumerations as essentially the same kind of thing and arranging them in parallel series so that one fills gaps left by the other. Okay, so the real reason why set theory exists and is the, the theory that it is today, is because it forms ultimately a foundation for analysis. That's the real reason, okay? That the, the analysis requires real numbers because in, with the real numbers and the associated complex numbers, all our dreams can basically come true. We have some curve like this, we have another curve like this. They look like they intersect, therefore they do intersect because we're working over the real numbers. All number theoretic considerations as to what the actual nature of these things are is completely finessed. We can assume that Newton's algorithm, which will generate uh, intersections, can be run to infinity. And at the end, after we've run to infinity, we have a solution. Of course, our computers never can do this, rarely. As our computers are telling us something completely different from what we are claiming. And it's time that we stop this nonsense, believed our computers, and reorganized mathematics properly. Thank you. I have to give you this, yes. Well, fighting words there from Norman. Terrific. <laughs> uh, before I disagree with some of that, let me say that uh, there, are, there are a few things I do agree with. Firstly, that the answer is not obvious. Just because people have been talking as if there's infinities for 100 years or 150 doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't go back and look at uh, the actual reasons for them. And as Norman says, not everybody has agreed in that time. There is a serious problem because the mind is finite and so there's a problem grasping infinity if there is such a thing as infinity, and as also as Norman rightly says, what about computers? Uh, if, the, if what would mathematics be like if we abolished infinity? Well, we know the answer to this question because when computers were invented, uh, infinity was abolished. And what MATLAB and so similar programs do has a strange resemblance to mathematics. We know what it would be like to do that. Uh, Found, what about foundations? Uh, do, do we really need infinity and all these set theory f to found mathematics? Well, uh, I'm not so sure about that. It's, uh, it's uh, decorative, but uh, I think this school certainly seems to agree implicitly that you don't need that because they don't bother to teach any and haven't for some, some decades. <laughs> um, and also, you can't define infinity into existence. It's not as if we make it up. It's not as if we force the numbers to keep going and put a bracket around the end. No, you can't axiomatise something any more than you can cause there to be uh, 10 prime numbers between 10 and 20 just by uh, axiomatising. So uh, the questions are serious. Now, what about, the, I'll uh, organise myself uh, in these areas, what about a set? Uh, first of all, I could, uh, let me introduce you very briefly to the point of view of this, this book, An Aristotelian Philosophy of Mathematics, which says, has a view on what mathematics is. Uh, based on Aristotle's ideas, but not very uh, directly. A 
According to that, mathematics is about some aspects of the real world, including but not limited to the physical world, its quantitative and structural aspects. So properties like uh, symmetry, ratio, order, pattern, continuity, alternation, things like that. So uh, here's the board. It appears to have a symmetry that way and that way. Symmetry is something that can be had by non-physical things such as arguments, which might be the same top and bottom, might repeat the steps in the other order. It's a very abstract sort of property, but it's one that's actually realised, either perfectly or imperfectly, in, uh, in parts of the real world. If Norman and I stand beside you, you can see what the ratio of our heights is, at least approximately. Uh, that view of mathematics contrasts with uh, nominalist views that says, oh, it's just a, a logic or a language or um, what follows from arbitrary axioms or something like that. It's not really about anything. Uh, that's the way engineers think about it. They think that mathematics is a pile of Laplace transforms and methods and formulas that you get out of a box to do something real that's, that applies to the real world. Uh, I hope uh, you mathematicians don't have uh, any temptation to think that way. Uh, this point of view, the Aristotelian point of view, also contrasts with a Platonist view that says that mathematics is about something all right, but it's something in another world, in some ab world of abstract objects, quote unquote, whatever they are, that are somewhere else. That, of course, has a great difficulty in making sense of applied mathematics. So that's just a brief sketch. Uh, what is there is one uh, important thing about those, that where we say that mathematics is about properties, it doesn't have to be that those properties are actually realised in the real world. It's enough that they might be. So this is not special to mathematics. It's the same about what about the theory of colours. It could be that uh, there's a colour, and it's some, in David Hume's the philosopher's example, an uninstantiated shade of blue. Blue, it just so happens there's a particular shade of blue that is never the shade of any actual thing. Nevertheless, the science of colours uh, for example, science that says there's a relation between wavelength and what you see is, uh, applies to that as well. So uh, this is very relevant to things like infinity. We're not saying that there must be an actual infinity of, say, atoms, but we're saying that uh, infinity is a, a completely kosher number, the same as the others, that could in fact be realised and that we can understand what it means. OK, well, what if that's... Uh, what about mathematics in general? What is the uh, point of view on sets and numbers? What are we, that's a fair question. What is a set? And Cantor's definition about how we're collected in thought, that's, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, say there's anything in that at all. Sets are not things that are done by us or collected or made or something. That's just a, a kind of game, a, a story told to people in, who are introduced first to sets and can't understand what they mean. And then we tell them that there are sets that, of course, you can't collect in thought, quite rightly. So what is a set or a number? Well, it's like this. Um, you have four parrots. Well you, have, well, you have some parrot stuff. Let's not say four. There's, the way, there's parrot stuff here. The way parrots are as opposed to the way water is. Water is just stuff, you know, but parrots are not just stuff. The way parrots are, they come discreetly. A, a, a pile of parrot stuff must be a certain, must be discreetly organised into, into parrots. And it's the relation between the, the heap and the, the universal or property, as we say, structuring it, being a parrot, that's the number. And of course that's shared between a lot of other quadruples, like the four horsemen of the apocalypse and whatever. There's nothing about infinite versus finite there. It's just that this is, uh, this is you, you, we, we um, see finite ones. So do you see sets? Uh, yeah, sure. So I open the, at least small ones. You, I open the um, fridge and I see some white curvy surface in there. And the way it is about eggs is that, I can, is that the eggs are organised into three eggs. I, I see that. It's not just... Uh, Sur curved surfaces with positive curvature. That's one for my uh, classmates, cl class in <laughs> differential geometry over here. Nice to see you guys. Uh, it's that uh, the way eggs are, it's, uh, dis they're discreetly organised. And I see a set of three eggs. I see that there's three there. Of course, it's a little bit more difficult to see the empty set or, or the set of natural numbers. I agree with that. And we've got to think further about what reason you might have for thinking that uh, there are such things. So yeah, it's, it, what's important, the take home message, is they're not collected by us. I open that there's an actual, actual 
uh, three eggs in there. The, the, the threeness is in the, in the pile of eggs and I just perceive that or come to recognise it. It's out there. So what about all that stuff about Russell's paradox and everything? That there's difficulties about uh, sets. Russell's paradox is a paradox but it's not really about sets. It's about uh, self It's about attempts to describe a set. So the set of all sets that aren't members themselves. It's the same kind of thing as the, uh, the similar paradoxes about um, a barber that, what about the barber in the town that shaves everybody who doesn't shave himself? Does he shave itself? Nothing to do with sets. It's just language, as Wittgenstein said, going on holiday. It fails to, fails to refer because of, because of self-reference or some other problem about language. No, no skin off the nose of sets. It's just that uh, some ways of describing them are not adequate. Okay, now let's go on to what about the set of all natural numbers and why should you think so to speak, they're all there. Well, first let me uh, reply to, uh, do it in two parts, reply to the reasons uh, Norman was given such is the, the, you can't uh, grasp some of these uh, very, very difficult ones or complex numbers uh, and then talk about positive reasons for thinking that, uh, that you can talk about the completed set of natural numbers. Well, first of all, um, so what, what is the thesis? The thesis is that the numbers never run out. The thing that atoms, maybe atoms in the universe can run out, but you're not going to run out of numbers to count them with. Well, what about, what about this reason that uh, some of them are not really there when you get really big and it's complex to write down what they are? Well, that is not a number. It's a name of a number. We've got to keep very straight the connection, the distinction between names and the things they name. The primitive superstition that uh, you only have power over something if you can name it is what's behind the uh, grim fairy story of Rumpelstiltskin. You may, uh, so those with the right cultural background, will remember that the miller's daughter who's married the king uh, has, is under the power of the evil little man and can only get away from it if she knows his name. So she discovers that and escapes. But nevertheless, names are not things. Suppose I travel through the forest to a village of, of uh, people that I take to be primitive. It seems to me that I see many elephants in the forest. I arrive and politely say to them, you have many elephants in your forest. And they say, no, there's only three. And I say, okay, it seemed to me that there were lots. And they say, no, in our language, there are only three names of elephants. Elephants must be called either Jumbo, Norman or Norell. That's all there can be. And I'm polite and I don't answer them back, but it seems to me they've got uh, something wrong with uh, their philosophy of linguistics, shall we say. They're, 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 they're thinking the names wag the tail of the, do of the things. That's not how it should be. Then I ask them, I'm becoming a little suspicious, how many numbers are there according to you people? And they say, one, two, three, many. They've made the same mistake. They think that the, the limitations of their language or their ability to talk about or write down something uh, is a limit on the things themselves. That's not correct. And the argument here was the same. Yeah, it said that some, the complexity of the name in base 10 or whatever, in digits of some number is uh, too complex for my mind to do or, or the computer to write down or the board to hold. That's no skin whatsoever off the names of the numbers themselves. And remember going back to where we said you looked in the fridge, uh, the, whether that set is named or perceived or not has nothing to do with whether it exists. A recipe for a cake is not a cake. And a recipe for writing down an expression for a number is not a number. Okay, now what about positive reasons for thinking that you can, uh, so to speak, have all of these together? Well, if it, the way electrons, lions or parrots are is different from the way even pro the concept or universal even prime is. If you've got an even prime, you can't have any other ones. But it's not like that with uh, normal re repetitions like electrons or lions. Uh, it's possible to add one. And the basic reason for thinking that um, the numbers are completed is that and, and the numbers have no n is, that is, that they're infinite, is that you can always add one. Simple. Let me read the relevant paragraph from uh, 
the book, there's one classic straightforward and naive argument that has always been at the heart of belief in large infinite and finite num and large finite and infinite numbers. However many how you have, you could always add one more. It's a sound argument as it relies on an understanding of number founded on experience of small numbers, but to which their being small is not relevant. And what we mean is that you know perfectly well if you have that set and have that, you can have a set of five. What we're arguing is that if you have th this many parrots somewhere else, you can understand that it couldn't possibly make any difference to your adding one. And if you have that many, if this is that many plus 23, you can have that many plus 24. And likewise, if you had any other number, easily written down or not easily written down, you can always add one. Now, as uh, Norman rightly said, there's been an attempt to weasel out of that argument with the concept of potential infinity. And while I love Aristotle in general, his remarks about potential infinity are most unfortunate. The idea was that uh, even though they weren't, the numbers aren't sort of all there, uh, you can keep going and you never run out, but nevertheless you can't complete them. And the, you, tend to, you tend to write that article, you tend to put that argument in terms of what we can do as if we couldn't get to the end or we couldn't uh, put them all together and put the bracket at the end. But as we were saying, numbers have nothing to do with anything to do with, with us. They're out there or they're not out there. Uh, and here's an, a medieval argument that was a nice one on why you can't have potential infinity without also having actual infinity. Put in the terms that they liked, they said, suppose you had, and they believe this is possible, there's an infinite number of days up to the present. That, and they, let's suppose we mean a potential infinity so that if you look at the historical record, the geological record, etc., you could always keep going back. So suppose that was in, in, in a potential infinity, uh, on each of those days, an angel creates a grain of sand and puts it here. How many grains of sand are there now? Must be an actual infinity because it's an, an actual lot, but bigger than any, any finite number. Right, finally, let's have a ch challenge. If there are only finitely many numbers, there must be a biggest one. What is it? Please put it on the board, or, or it may, maybe the board is a little bit big, as, uh, a bit small for that kind of thing, but give us an idea of its magnitude and hopefully not limited to any actual or def uh, potential computing power. Now finally, what about the continuum? Uh, yeah, it's quite true that uh, if you've established that this set is all right and there, it's still, you still haven't got to there and you need to do something else. And... Uh, it's difficult in a sense because, again, we have an algorithm which appears to mean we're kind of reverting to names about it. So whether there's an algorithm to, for something is uh, not much to the point of whether it exists. That's just to do with the, your convenience in calculating with. Choice, uh, yeah, well, this is getting more, more to the point. And the basic reason, and I wouldn't say it was quite as strong as the reason for thinking that the natural numbers exist, is that if you take... You take that, just all zeros, and let's suppose that having, uh, having uh, uh, done question two, we let that be, uh, com think of that as completed, as we suppose we've got up to that stage. Well, yeah, what about choice? Uh, it's, it's true you, do, you need an axiom of choice, but the idea is there is a symmetry in any point between what, if, if we're dealing in binary, any one of them could be one. You, you could change, but it's not about you. It's not about you. It's just that uh, there is a symmetry at each point, at each of those infinite number of points, between zero and one. So in the mass, you should agree that of them all having the same status of a as any particular one. It's a symmetry argument. Whether, whether computable or uncomputable or, what, or whatever, the mass, of, the mass of these got by changing a any one or, or any, any subset yeah, you have to think of the subs. It's, it's, it's true that it's uh, equivalent to thinking of subsets. Uh, the, the mass of them should be regarded as just as real as any particular one. Uh, that is all. Time to, time to change back for five minutes of uh, back and forth. Well, th 
thanks, Jim. Uh, so I'll just say a few words about uh, a few uh, things that uh, Jim uh, raised. I'll just say a few words. So w this question about uh, always adding one. So yes, so certainly we can add one to this, and this 23 will become a 24. Uh, but the problem is that if we add one not just once or twice, but trillions and trillions of, of times, quadzillions of times, eventually the number that we're writing up here will get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it will start to overwhelm our computer. Okay? So it is a computational thing. That the, the argument that you can always add one is a very local argument that you're only looking very small. If you actually look at what actually happens over a long period of time, eventually the size of this number will overwhelm us. The complexity will overwhelm us, and it just dissolves in, into some kind of a ambiguity. Uh, and a parallel to that is, uh, suppose we ask the question, how far can a person walk? Okay, okay. There's probably, it's hard for it to say what, what a limit is. Well, maybe I can walk for, for 10 miles, maybe you can walk for 20 miles, maybe somebody else can walk for 20,000 miles. Okay, but what is, is probably certain is that nobody can walk an unlimited amount of time, an unlimited amount. Okay. We all end up eventually stopping and collapsing and, and, and finishing. Okay. So it's, it's, it's not possible to write down a biggest number, but that does not prove that you can get all the numbers together. It's not prove, does not prove that there's an infinite number of uh, numbers. In fact, the, if the universe is finite, which most physicists probably think it's true, then it's clear that there's only a finite number of possible things that you can write down in the universe. So, Conceptually, there are only a finite number of possible things that could be numbers. Um, I'd like to also say a little bit about uh, Jim's Aristotelian uh, point of view. So, uh, for years, I was a, a closet Platonist. Most pure mathematicians are Platonists. We believe in Plato's theory of ideal forms, that what we're doing with mathematics, these miraculous things, is in some nether world that's hard to say exactly where it is. I've been thinking about uh, Jim's point of view and this Aristotelian uh, position, and I think it has a, a lot to recommend it. And in fact, I think it actually fits in perhaps well with what I'm trying to, to say. That, I, that the existence of this set of natural numbers is, is for many people so, out in some platonic world that's independent of our physical world. If we don't believe in this platonic world and insist that the mathematics that we do is ultimately based on applied mathematics, on computations, on explicit things of our world, then it becomes uh, much more suspect to think about such abstractions. And finally, I would like to uh, just uh, amuse you with a, a little game, okay, that shows the, the, perhaps the silliness of thinking that you can understand infinite uh, sets. So let's play a game, let's play two little games. So there's an infinite number of balls in that corner, Okay, they're labeled one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Okay, now, if you're a standard student, you say, yeah, no problem, there's an infinite number of balls in that corner. And here I have a box, and we're going to put the balls in the box. We're going to go over to the, the, the pile and pick up ten of these, and come over to the box, and we're going to dump nine in to the box, and throw one in that corner. Okay, and then we're going to go over again, pick up another ten, dump nine in the box, throw one in that corner. Okay, and now let's go to infinity. Which, yeah. So let's take the limit. Okay. We'll go super duper fast and perform all these infinite number of operations so that there are no more balls over there. Okay, I have a, bo a box full of, of balls, right? How many balls are in the box? Infinity. An infinite number. How many balls are in the corner? An infinite number. Are we all agreed on that? <laughs> Does anybody think that the situation is something different? Yeah. What do you think? Okay, so I, 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 this is language that I, in fact, don't believe in, but I'm, I'm sort of playing the, the usual game. Okay. <laughs> all right, so let's play a similar game. Let's put all of the, the, ba the balls back over here in this corner, and I'm going to play a very similar game. I'm going to pick up the ten balls, and I'm going to dump them in the box, and I'm going to reach in and, and take one of the balls that's in the box and put it in the corner. There are now nine balls here, one ball there, right? And I'm going to go back, take another ten. I'm going to dump all ten into the box, and then I'm going to reach in, take one, and put it over there. And I'm going to carry on to infinity. <laughs> I'm going to take the limit. OK, so we run super duper fast. There are no more balls over there. We finish the process. 
How many balls are over there? An infinite number of balls. How many balls are in the box? Uh, well, the box is the same box that we used in the previous one. No, there's not an infinite number of uh, balls in the, in the box. Can anybody tell me how many balls there are in the box? No, um, what does that mean? I want a specific number. I'm looking in the box. How many are there in there? Not zero. There are not zero. Not zero. Give me a number. I'll give me a, <laughs> that's too big for my brain. Give me a smaller number. Uh, two. Two, okay. 42, okay. Yes, there are, uh, let me say two. Two is easier. There are exactly two balls in the box. Let me sh show you. See, there are two balls. Why are there two balls in the box? Because at, when I took the first 10 in and I picked one out, you didn't, you didn't notice this, but I picked out ball number three. I put it over there. And then the next, with the next lot, I didn't pick out randomly, I picked up ball number four and put it over there. And then as we go to infinity, there are only two balls left in the box. Such is the glory of, of big masters of infinity. Okay? I think it's time that such nonsense stopped. Okay, well, the same as, same as before, I don't think talk about uh, complexity of the name of a number or what you can do in time or how you can write something down is to the point. Numbers aren't like that. They're just out there and our naming practices, thoughts or anything, don't have any effect on them. All we can do is know something about them and the way to know things about them is, is by symmetry, that they, they have an extraordinary degree of symmetry among them. And that's one of the reasons for thinking there's no last one, and also reason to thinking that there's no hidden symmetry in these that means some exist and some less so. Uh, uh, Norman thought that uh, an Aristotelian philosophy of mathematics might suit his point of view quite well, is, uh, yeah, there's something in that, there's something in that. And uh, it's certainly true that many of my Aristotelian friends uh, think that all properties must be realised in the uh, physical or similar world and in that case they might find themselves uh, agreeing fully with, uh, with Norman. Mm, so that is good if Norman founds a kind of finitest Aristotelian school and that will keep us going and we'll get some grants and we'll, we'll, we'll have a great time together. <laughs>